This is Bruce Dickinson, and you're listening to Monsters, Madness, and Magic. All right, folks. Welcome to the Monsters, Madness, and Magic podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. Now, in this episode, I chat with legendary vocalist Bruce Dickinson about growing up on the pulps, hammer horror films, writing fiction, psychedelic experiences, and more. As always, thank you all for listening out there. And if you'd like to help the show grow and you're listening on your podcasting platform of choice, please leave us a review. And if you happen to be watching the video on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe. Anyway, without further ado, here you go. First of all, thank you a lot for giving me some of your time. I know you're a busy man and all that good stuff. Oh, so I'm just sitting, I've got my, I'm sitting on a cloud at the moment, quite literally. I mean, we're up on the hill in, in LA and there's this like, you know, as storms come in, like plague of frogs and all the rest of it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've got my own individual cloud just surrounding me. It's kind of cool. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Well, Bruce, I don't do anything fancy. I know we've got a limited time here and just have an icebreaker. I like to ask everyone and then we're off to the races. All right. So, uh, Mr. Dickinson, take us back in time. You're a youngster. Are you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, or all of the above? <laughs> I'm all of the above. I mean, uh, did you say fort builder? I did. Oh, my God. I used to build forts. We had, um, when I was at, at like... Uh, Yes, primary school. It's like you know, must have been like yeah, probably four years old, and uh, yeah, they had they had these like wooden bricks, and you could make stuff out of them. So yeah, it was like building a castle, and then you know they had a raid on the castle, and then I was like <laughs> throwing bricks at other kids, and then they sent me home, you know, for like you know extreme violence, you know. No, so anyway, yeah, I, I I was one of those kids who basically nowadays I would have been medicated at birth, but but but. <laughs> Back then, they just said, go climb a tree, you know. <laughs> you know. Fort building and troublemaking all wrapped into one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, that, that, that was it. That was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was all of those things. So since you were a book reader, what, uh, did you have any uh, specific authors or genres that you leaned towards early on? Um, I was a combination of um, factual things and uh I, I i read a lot of trashy um kind of like uh early early 20th century you know adventure adventure novels you know talking to robert howard stuff like that no biggles mm, gotcha <laughs> yeah, yeah all, all that kind of like biggles stuff and uh i was devouring like commando comics and stuff like that um uh, as well as uh i had a subscription to a comic we had called tv 21 which was all the, the thunderbirds the jerry anderson stuff and everything captain scarlet and the mr ons and all that all that stuff dan dare the mekon the eagle uh and um but i was an early reader so i mean all i remember was like hanging out in a lot of libraries because um you know i didn't I was I was reasonably solitary, and I was interested a lot in like military history. And I used to play, well, before Dungeons and Dragons, it was called war gaming, but it's the same stuff, you know. Yeah. But it's like little soldiers and dice and everything else, and you argue about how far your cannon was away from that guy, and you know whether or not the president was in town. Therefore, your men weren't going to fall over, you know, <laughs> all that stuff. Um, so I, I did a lot of that, and a lot of the backup to that. Um, I mean, fiction wise, um, then. Um, uh, we were, I, I mean, the, I suppose, uh, if it wasn't like trashy stuff, um, comics, American comics, I, uh, I, I was, I was really into, I was really into Dr. Strange and I really liked the Silver Surfer, mm. um, Superman, I didn't get at all. Uh, I was just like, what is this crap? You know, I mean, this do goody, 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 goody guy that like, you know, <laughs> wears his underpants on the outside of his trousers get, you know, come on, just, just go, and, just go and bang Lois Lane. You know, she wants it. You know, come on. You know, I mean, so I never got Superman. Um, I, I love the human torch because, uh. you know, because you got figure that as an adolescent, you know, you know, you, you don't know anything about girls at all. So he could set fire to himself. He could fly and all the girls wanted to jump his bones. So I was like, I want to be him uh, or Dr. Strange because he could control everything. And as an adolescent, you can control nothing. 
exactly. and, the, and the silver surfer because he's just pissed off which i was <laughs> you know, um, and and you know and the rest of it you know or you get the guy with the bendy arms never got him you know don't like who want i don't want i don't want to be a piece of chewing gum you know so so, <laughs> right. so uh the, so the, you know my, my stuff with the you know the big american comics i mean i was fairly addicted to that 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 era of the, all those english like puppet shows, Thunderbirds, Captain Scarlet and the Mistrons, Fireball XL5, you know, even some of the real early ones, um, and the paraphernalia that went along with it, uh, sort of before Star Wars and things like that uh, came out. Um, Fantasy-wise, I mean, it was like if it, Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and stuff like that. So I, I read, yeah. read The Hobbit when I was like 10, and then Lord of the Rings, I, I think it was it the following year, you know, so 10 or 11 when I read those. Um, and they were pretty, they were, they were average to middling mind blowing. So, you know, that those sort of things. And then we would get, we would get set books at school, which were kind of cool. Fahrenheit 451, uh, Brave New World, um, that mm. sort of stuff, you know, um, 1984 down and out Paris and London, you know, those, those sorts, sorts of dystopian, dystopian type novels. Uh, so yeah, it was, you know, it was, it was reasonably, reasonably broad. I mean, uh, I remember reading Bram Stoker, um, the original Dracula, you know, Bram mm -hmm. Stoker's Dracula, and that was cool. I thought that was that was a great, that was a great novel. You know, it was uh, good. But but yeah, that was that was it. Nothing, uh, you know. But I think I read early because I could read early. That was I, I don't know why that was, but uh, I remember when I was um, I must have been I must have been four, and uh, I was definitely reading, uh, you know fairly well by then because i remember my granddad who was a coal miner we used to live in his uh like um coal mining house where they you know they gave you a house if you were a, a coal miner yeah and we used to get every, there was no like heating or anything so it, it was all had to be coal fires so we got like a, a ton of coal would get delivered for, as a freebie because you were a miner and everything ran off that so he would make the fire in the morning and did this like hideously dangerous thing with a with a big sheet of newspaper where you put the sheet of newspaper over the front of the fire as it was burning to get a kind of a good draft going up through the uh but of course you know the the chances were that the sheet of newspaper might just ignite you know so you know, and the house burns down you know so it was kind of i used to like watching it i'm a, i'm an absolute addict i'm a complete pyromaniac i love fire but um he got this sheet of newspaper out and and put it up on the fire. It was like the Daily Mirror or something, which is like a, a, an English back then. It was a broadsheet, I think. And uh, and 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 it was like Yuri Gagarin, first man in space. And I was just like, "You can't burn that! No, get it down!" <laughs> and I, I I whipped it off and and and, and read it because I was totally into space. I loved space. I was a you know I, I was one of a child of that era. You know, so mm. when Apollo thirteen went up and and they had the problem with it. Um, uh, my folks actually let me stay up all night watching all the, you know, the updates, and I made notes. I wish I could find the notes now, you know, because I was <laughs> yeah. make, making notes on everything and drawings of like the the command module and how it worked, all that kind of shit, you know. So yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so was anyone in your family? Maybe you just mentioned your grandfather. Uh, where was anyone artistically or musically inclined? Do you think that's where your roots lie in regards to those attributes? Um, honestly, no, there was mm. like, there was, uh, dad had some, you know, weird, weird, weird records, which you play from time to time, like Frankie Lane and stuff like that. Um, which actually I, I thought at the time, but like, what is this rubbish? You know, but actually Frankie Lane's kind of cool. You know, now I, I look, look back and think <laughs> yeah. actually, you know, and he older would, and wiser uh, yeah and and then he then he would uh, play like uh it, his record collection was like you know edith piaf and frankie lane and basically not michelle he never really played music um and uh there was no instruments lying around i mean i think somehow wait, i think it was a second-hand piano accordion lying around a bit i used to make noises on that um there was a terrible guitar which just hung on the wall which was hideously out of tune uh, and was untunable, actually. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I had to go playing that and got 
some book play in a day or something by Bert Whedon and, and got a couple of chords together and you know, thought, hmm, it'd be nice to go and play guitar. We did, I, I lived in a hotel for a while. My parents ran a hotel, like a small, like a, almost like a boarding house type place. And um, we, had a, we had a rock band that used to come and stay there on a regular basis. And I remember going to the, uh, they actually couldn't think of what, what to do with me for the afternoon. So they said, oh, they're, they're going to the movies. Uh, mm. And they tag, I kind of tagged along, you know. And it was like a big deal because they, 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 they took a taxi. I'd, I'd never been in a taxi. I was like, wow, this is really cool. I'm sitting in the taxi with all these people with long hair. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, they were a band called The Casuals. And they had a, it had a, like a minor hit with a track called Jessamine. And, uh, but the cool thing was that the guy showed me, um, I think it was a Fender Strat. The guy showed me his Fender Strat back at the, uh, back at the hotel and let me Shit. like play, play with it. I was like, wow. And then he explained how it worked, you know, with the, the pickups and the, you know, the coils and everything. And I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. That's interesting. But I bet the other kids at school don't know that shit, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and then what, and the, at my, uh, at my other school, you know, we started getting into, um, I started getting to music really when I went to, really when I went to boarding school, to be mm. honest with you. Because, you know, that was everybody's salvation there was, uh, you know, people retreated into the world of music. And uh, I just heard all this stuff coming from behind other people's doors and used to knock on the door and go, what is that? You know, right. uh, so also we had a kind of a, a bizarrely enlightened art teacher who took it upon himself to be a concert promoter. And so all these bands would turn up at the school and some of them were pretty trippy i mean so we had uh first band i ever saw was a band called uh wild turkey which was glenn cornick the bass player from jethro toll who quit and had a solo outfit called uh, wild turkey um and um they were i mean i've still got the album it's an excellent album Shit. um and uh then we had the uh, we had arthur brown so mm. as in Crazy World of Arthur Brown, but it was Arthur Brown's Kingdom Come. We had Van de Graaff Generator because the singer actually went to the school, uh, as did the sax player. Um, the pre before I went, before I the year before I arrived at the school, they'd had Genesis with Peter Gabriel, you know. Jeez. Uh, and Queen, we just missed getting Queen because Queen were booked, but they said they had to cancel because they something happened and they suddenly became very famous. You know? <laughs> Um, it happens so, <laughs> so I, I i saw you know quite a few bands and things like that from my mind-blowing stuff a lot of weird prog jazz rocky stuff magma um and a band called zebra as well uh which uh, bizarrely so i'm watching this band called zebra and the rhythm section a phenomenal rhythm section and later on you know a matter of five years later i'm in a studio with the bass player who was a part of that rhythm section and he was producing the Samson record, John McCoy, because he was in the Gillen band. I was like, hang on, were you in Zebra? He went, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you played at my school. You know what I mean? Small yeah. world. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, when you think about the formative films and TV shows that you grew up on, what comes to mind? Oh, Hammer. You know, I mean, yeah, Universal, Universal Horror, um, all, the, all the, you know, Frankenstein, Son of Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, you know, Frankenstein rides again, Frankenstein meets <laughs> werewolf and then goes on a bicycle ride, you know, uh, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein and have an ice cream, you know, I mean, all these, you know, spin offs and everything. I used to love all that stuff. Um, and I used to love, uh, I mean, I used to, quite a lot of, quite a lot of black and white war movies as well, because mm. it was still in the shadow of the, of the Second World War, you know, there's still people, uh, I was born in, 58 so it's it's only 12 years 13 years after after the end of the second world war so plenty of people around who were you know not not geriatric yet who who had been in it um or people who had been very close oh as well of course it was the cold war so there was always the, the doomsday clock and the the threat of nuclear extinction which you know actually made life quite exciting because you know, you thought you just get on with life because you know, whilst you've still got one, you know, 
Yeah. Um, Because uh, if the bonds start falling, there's not a hell of a lot you can do to prevent it. So just get on with what you're doing, you know? Exactly. Yeah. I, I kind of took a guess in the dark about the Hammer Horror films because uh, I kind of thought that you might be interested in those after watching the Rain on the Graves video. Yeah, it was a complete homage to uh, to Hammer. We uh, the, the the so Ryan, the director, and I we did just share this love of that that era. It was like a, it's kind of like a it's spooky naive horror, you know. Mm. It's not, um, it's. It's not like the gore. It's not like the gore fest stuff that you get now, um, and nor is it um, the psychological horror and and the sort of the evil of something like The Exorcist. Um, and I mean, a really well done gore fest is you know I mean I mean the original um, the original uh, um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is still for me one of the all time great. Uh, horror horror movies one um, of the best yeah yeah i mean just just terrifying because you're emotionally wrapped up in you know uh um and it's not just a bunch of special effects and things squirting and eyeballs popping out stuff like that i used i used to love i was a big fan of the prisoner the tv series the prisoner very eccentric tv show um uh, i'm i'm just re-watching uh when i can find it um, all the episodes of a tv show called the invaders um, which I absolutely love. Conspiracy theory, alien, uh, aliens, are, aliens are amongst us uh, <laughs> that look like us. You know, like sounds like V almost. Uh, yeah, well, it was just 1966. This, mm, okay. this, this was this series, and they made two seasons of it, and then that was the end of that. I never figured out, never figured out why, but it's got great music to it. Really, really amazing intro music to it, and things like that. So, uh, yeah, so that that those are sorts of things um i mean i went to see uh you know all the all the big a lot of the big like british blockbusters of the day you know so there was the battle of britain and 633 squadron and then charge of the light brigade the new version and and things like that you know all that stuff this is something i like to ask everyone just because you never know uh what scared you as a kid um uh the, 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 my dad mm. <laughs> he was scary yeah. yeah yeah no i was scared of him everybody was scared of him you know uh so uh for that reason i tended to try and avoid him you know yeah did you ever have to deal with bullies or anything at boarding school oh yeah 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 no i had the shit kicked out of me um so uh so but it, you know i just i thought it was part of the course i thought it was just uh it's what happened if you were uh, different, and mm. if you if you if you were not only different, but if you didn't mind, uh, you know, facing up to people and saying, "Well, yeah, you know, blah blah blah," and they said, "Well, you're kind of stupid." I said, "Well, no, actually, you you know, I, I think it I think it is the other way, you know." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, do you recall your very first time on stage as a performer? Did it go off smoothly? Did your pants fall down? Anything like that? uh yeah i my first time on stage was actually probably at um at primary school or thereafter like nativity play you know and uh i was involved in a i was involved in a fracas backstage because i wanted the angel's wings and uh yeah because they were cool looking things you know so anyway that i didn't get the angel's wings but I was in a few, like, well, quite a lot of, like, amateur amateur dramatic type stuff, like performances at school until I started getting into music and then realized that maybe some of the stuff that I did uh, on stage might kind of transfer in some way, you know, because you are standing on stage, you are looking the audience in the eye. And, um, you know, uh, but I, I, I think I would have been a, pretty awful actor because actors take things very seriously you know yeah them, they think it's very hey they craft very seriously um uh, which is cool and very good and when you get a really great actor it's like that's really hard to do i appreciate how difficult it is to do you know what they do to make you believe that there's somebody else um but i just couldn't take that that seriously it's like oh come on it's pretending it's dressing up come on guys you know <laughs> and um there were people people said yeah you've got to 
as a savage, you know. So anyway, I ended up doing doing music. I wanted to be a drummer. I didn't want to be a singer. Um, I wanted to be a drummer. It goes back to that thing about, you know, people, you know, being medicated at birth because you're just bouncing off the walls. So to <laughs> me, drumming was like bouncing off the walls. I was like, yeah, that, it's an instrument that, that just, you know, you, you hit a lot, you hit a lot of stuff in, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. Um, and then I realized it was more complicated than that. And by chance, um, discovered that um when i opened my mouth things came out that that seemed to work yeah. um so i i i didn't really have a problem with uh tuning you know i mean not not really i was like i was always i was always in tune um i didn't fully understand anything about music at that point because i couldn't play an instrument or anything like that but i just seemed to have a i like the drama of singing right. and uh yeah i just i just kind of took to it it was weird i um i had no great plan but i just kind of drifted along and started a band and then that band i got better i, I then i kind of got better than the band i learned everything that the band could kind of teach me and then somebody else came and said hey you should join our band so I'd join a better band and then I'd learn stuff from them and 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 you'd start, like like the cream, you'd kind of rise to the top. Yeah. And then and then you got nowhere else to go. So you either just stay there or you you move on to something better. I mean, I guess it's like being a like sports person or whatever, you know, you, you get transferred one team to little league to big, you know, and until finally, you know, you hit like the major league and you think oh my god okay this is it you know this is um this is this is this is do or die at this point you know um, yeah did you know that you had a great singing voice yourself did you have that confidence or was it a family member or maybe a another bandmate or someone that told you no no it was a weird one it was um it was one of those things that funny enough it was in church right because i we used to have to go to church at both the school I was in up till like 13, you know, and uh, you'd go to church for like singing lessons. Well, not lessons. You just go and sing a bunch of hymns. Right. Um, and uh, I quite liked hymns. Hymns had some, they had some kind of cool tunes and some of the lyrics were quite, you know, epic, you know, sort of like big, like, like big Babylonian battles and God and the devil and stuff. I'm like, yeah, this is cool shit, you know, um it, so uh i was uh singing along and i was actually uh i guess i must have been 11 or 12 or something or maybe a bit younger i don't know but the 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 the, the reverend whatever his name was the reverend what was his name it was the reverend bs sharp his name was what a name we, uh, yeah bs sharp reverend sharp so we just called him batty he was batty sharp <laughs> and uh so batty was walking up and down and he was completely stone deaf in one ear so he would like walk wander around with his head on one side like this you know because he couldn't hear out the other ear and uh and as he came past um i decided to sort of like you know take the mickey and i started singing really 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 loud objectionably loud you know and um and he put his dodgy ear wait wait it, Hi, you have a very fine voice, and then wandered off. And I was like, "Do I? You know? Oh, really? I don't think. I thought. I think he was actually serious. You know. So it just planted a little seed, which didn't flower until I was like fifteen or sixteen or something like that. Um, when I was playing in my first ever band, you know, which was put together with a bunch of other kids at this school couple of two people with acoustic guitars a guy who played the bass and also was shared the uh the head of the war games society with me as well so we'd be <laughs> refighting waterloo and then playing the bass and then and i was playing the bongos i didn't have a kit so i thought well <laughs> i'll start with bongos right and um yeah so we 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 were rehearsing and and he couldn't hit the high notes and let it be so they said look shut up on the bongos because it's given us a headache uh give them a hand so i opened my mouth and they went oh yeah yeah you're the singer yeah 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 so i, I went off with one of the guitar players and he had the 
like BB King songbook. So he was playing BB King songbook, and I was massacring the blues and ter doing terrible things to the blues, um, but mainly because I loved Ian Gillan. So he's kind of bluesy, and but he obviously at the time, you know, his, it was all about his screaming. So I just do BB King with a lot of screaming, you know, <laughs> totally inappropriate. But uh, <laughs> hey, whatever, you know, um, youth is blind and deaf. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, so uh, yeah, and then I got kicked out of school. And thought, oh, you know, what do we do now? You know, that's the end of my, end of my hopeful like, rock and roll career. Um, and uh, then I was at this school, like where I actually lived, which was a regular school. And weirdly enough, one of the kids, I uh, was this kid I went to school with five years ago, and he played drums. And he was actually no, not too bad of a drummer, you know. I think he's a he's a he's a lawyer now or something like that, you know. I mean, but he. He, uh, these other kids were all sitting in the back, you know, all, all, the, all, the, all the interesting people sitting at the back of the class, you know, and I'm just turned up to this place and I hear them talking. Somebody's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, you know, I don't know what we're going to do because, you know, we haven't got a singer for tonight, you know, because he's quit, you know, da, da, da. and I went, ah, ah, this is my chance. Oh, and I, stick my, and I said, hey, I said, um, 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 I sing a, a bit. And they went, really? Oh. Well, you're in then. Come on, <laughs> and that was it, and and that was it. And so it was lit. It was a garage band, like they played in in in, in uh, the, uh, Rob Hodgson, his name was, and uh, they played in Rob Hodgson's dad's garage, and um, they knew the first uh, the first side of Wishbone Ash Argus that tr that album, the Throw Down the Sword and Warrior and all that kind of stuff, um, and uh, a few Thin Lizzy's songs and the inevitable smoke on the water and black night <laughs> so i was like yeah i can sing all this stuff so we did that and we actually did a couple of gigs funnily enough we called ourselves uh their first name was paradox and i went that sounds that's a terrible name that sounds like some kind of like soap powder you know uh <laughs> as, as, uh, as i said i said yeah, well, let's go some let's do something epic man let's do something really epic i mean come on let's let's go greek you know what about calling ourselves sticks so uh they went ah sticks yeah but isn't there an american band i said don't take details boy they, they won't mind you know we're no threat <laughs> you know <laughs> so so we um we call ourselves sticks and we did like a whole two gigs i think in our entire career but we all went off to university after that and um so yeah and then anyway so i'm at university and i'm in, in this other one or two bands in the lead up to joining samson <laughs> and uh and my, my parents got a bill for like you know three thousand dollars from the tax man because sticks had played a show in the uk and they didn't have an address but they realized that i was called sticks so <laughs> they must be the same you know <laughs> yeah that, they straightened that out but it was very funny i wish i still had a letter you know it doesn't sound like it but uh did you ever have to deal with stage fright or anything like that um uh, yeah i mean nerves but i'm mm. i'm not I've never been one for being absolutely petrified and unable to move at the side of the stage. You know, the thing that scares me um, more than stages, audiences, audiences don't scare me. What scares me is if I go out there and, and give a bad performance. I'm so scared of opening my mouth and it sounding rubbish, you know, that, that that's the thing that I worry about the most. So, once I get my feet under the desk, as it were, and I'm I'm on, on, on tour and doing something, you know, every night or every other night, you know, then I'm, I'm not really nervous at all because I have the confidence of knowing that it's going to sound okay. But if something goes wrong and you have you have a shitty night or something, then it it can knock your confidence a bit, you know, just something you have to deal with. Unfortunately, I mean, most the thing with a singer is you can't hide behind anything. Um, like guitarists can always, you know, they they've got a plank in front of them, you know. So I mean, you know, they always the guitarists, you know, if they play a bum note, they look at the guitar and say, "How dare you do that?" <laughs> you know I mean? um, the singer, you can't get away with that, you know. Right. So I wanted to ask you, uh, you dip, you've dipped your toe in the writing over the years. I believe your first novel was nineteen ninety. 
Uh, yeah, the, the, the adventures of Lord Iffy Boat Race. Yeah. Yeah. How does your, what does your writing, general writing process look like? Are you an outliner or do you like to go with the flow and fix it later? Um, I like to, I, now I think I, I like to have a, I like to have a bit of a plan. I like to have a, a you know, a structure. I mean, Lord Iffy Boat Race was written, it was quite short. Um, and, and that was written basically to save my sanity whilst I was on the road. So I wrote mm. the whole thing on hotel note paper. Um, so, uh, you know, I just get bits. I, I don't know why I didn't go out and just buy sheets of paper. <laughs> but I thought it was more fun to write it on the backs of bits of hotel note paper. So the whole thing was written that way. And um, I wrote it um, chapter by chapter. And um, some of the guys on the crew got quite into, well, what's the next chapter then? I said, well, I, I haven't written it yet. Well, come on, you know, get on with it. So I would read them chapter by chapter by chapter. They would they would get the whole thing, and it was quite good because you got the you you got an actual feedback from people from reading it. You could see where the laughs were. You could see where people thought it was funny, and that gave you the the kind of the the gumption to carry on. Really, that, that you know, I mean, it was a a comedic novel. There's a there's a there's a a uh, an English comic writer. Um, called Tom Sharp. Um, and uh, it was similar to Tom Sharp, but um, much more of a, a car crash. He's quite subtle. Um, and I was like, uh, no, I, I want to write in his kind of wry, slightly sideways looking style of things, but um, it is going to be gross. You <laughs> know, I wanted, I, wanted, I wanted to do that, that style of writing but gross uh, right. <laughs> and um so i i took it along to some publishers and and this guy from sidgwick and jackson who were quite you know posh publishers you know they published memoirs from prime ministers and stuff like that the guy went this is really funny i went yeah i i yeah really honestly <laughs> you know it's like for normal people it's funny he said yeah it's really funny he said i'm gonna i'm gonna do it through it so it actually came out, and um, I mean, now it God, it would be. I mean, I'm not even sure you could publish it now because it's so unwoke; it's all over the place, you know. Um, yeah. But nevertheless, it it is kind of funny. I mean, it's, it's viscerally funny, you know. If you can get past the fact that you know it's, there's there's every stereotype in the book there, you know, <laughs> and and they're deliberate. The stereotypes are deliberate, you know. There's the drunken Scotsman, and there's the nymphomaniac you know woman then there's the butler there's a pedophile semi-pedophile butler you know and all this kind of weird stuff um and of course lord iffy himself who's um a, a, an english aristocrat who's transvestite but only below the knee and um he uh is broke like most english aristocrats so <laughs> uh he uh he he come he's all all style and no substance when it comes mm. to money um so uh he he decides to the basic plot is he decides that he's he's going to come up with this crazy idea for reanimate for for having grouse shooting grouse is like this little game bird that they shoot right and it has a season he said you know if i could if i could have mechanical grouse we could have grouse shooting all the year round ah damn it i'll invite some of my old chums from school up and uh we'll 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 try it out so all these people go up like a dozen people go up to um his estate in uh, Scotland. And um, basically weird things start happening to them all because they all start murdering each other or having sexual relationships with strange machinery or whatever it is, you know? Right. <laughs> so I know that uh, you've got this uh, graphic novel attached to the Mandrake pro project. How hands-on are you with the writing process going forward? Uh, yeah. I mean, pretty, pretty hands-on. Uh, what I, um, Real, oh, what, what this goes back to like 2014. I was getting back into comics again, and I went and bought all my uh, bought the big like reissue versions of Silver Surfer and you know Doctor Strange, and I reread all those things and a lot of things that I hadn't read when I was a kid because you couldn't get them in the UK. So I was in a comic store in Chicago and came back with an armload of books and started reading them all. And there was one Doctor Strange episode called "If Eternity Should Fail." 
And I thought, what a great title for a record. Whoa, there you go. There's, there's the title for my next solo album. So I wrote this song called If Eternity Should Fail. Um, and I had a bunch of ideas for other, other songs as well. And my initial intention was to do a one, a single comic that would go with the album, like a promo item, more or less. But the story of the comic would be reflected in the album. So, so there'd be a narrator and it would be, you know, it would be the excuse for a story to run through the, the thread of the album. So I read it. I did a couple of lyrics for a couple of the tunes that were related to that. And the story was very simple. Uh, a guy, a guy. Uh, it's based on a, a track I did called "Accident of Birth." Um, so, in "Accident of Birth," a, a guy survives his uh, at, at birth, but his brother dies. His brother's in the underworld. The guy's in contact with him psychically. He's tortured. He's got survivor's guilt. He's angry against God and man and everything. You know, why did I survive? Why? Blah blah blah. Well, now imagine there's technology that can bring his brother back. Um, and that was the start of the, that particular comic. And I had the two characters, Dr. Necropolis and Professor Lazarus, as the, the good guy and the bad guy. Mm. So a very simple black and white type story. You know, um, good, evil, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but that album didn't get made and I didn't go back to it until seven years later. So in the meantime, the story had kind of moved on and I was working, you know, or not working. I was, I was tinkering around on zoom calls during the COVID, you know, stuff. And, um, I was talking to these, like some guys who were Hollywood script writers and some pretty cool ones as well. And we were just swapping stories with each other. And I said, look, I've got this crazy story. Um, tell me if they, tell me if you think this sucks. What do you think? So I ran the basic plot of the Mandrake Project, which wasn't called the Mandrake Project, but then it didn't have a name even. Um, it was like, Dr. Necropolis in the House of Death. I mean, it was like, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's, and it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a good hammer story, a good hammer yeah. title there, you know. Um, so, so I, and they said, that, that, no, that story's really got legs. I mean, yeah, you should you should develop that. I said, yeah, but what, okay, I, I could develop it, uh, but where do, where do I take it? Where, I mean, when I just send it to Netflix? They went, and, and the guy that told me this was Kurt Sutter that wrote Sons of Anarchy and, and everything. And, and he said, no, 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 don't do that. He said, do a comic. I went, I was thinking of doing a comic. He said, yeah. He said, look, um, I've done a comic. I'll, I'll, it's not like any other form of writing. Um, I'll send you the script underpins my comic i'll send you the comic the script that underpins it the character sketches the backstory basically the keys to the kingdom for his comic mm -hmm. so i read that and and thought well the first thing to do is to come up with really develop these characters then really develop the subsidiary characters and then find out how many episodes this is because it was already four and then i went no 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 four is not enough uh, and, and so finally i get to 12 12 sounds good you know 12 is three books um yeah. so uh then i did the synopsis of all 12 episodes and then i've got the character sketches i've got the backstory i've got a lot of detail and, and everything and i took it to z2 and and pitched it to them and said look I, I i know this is not what you necessarily normally do um you know, you you really they're really good at doing the you know the one off comic books for rock and roll bands. I said, but this is not that. This is this is uh, more like a kind of a Watchmen type project. Yeah, um, and they were all over it. They went, yeah, we actually we we we'd love to do that. You know, we 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 kind of aspire to do that one day. And and here you are, and you walk in, and it's basically complete. Well, except for the fact that we episode one, uh, you've got to do the script for it. Uh so. I realized that, you know, this was a world that this is not, I mean, I've written screenplays before. Uh, so I kind of know without saying I'm any good, but you, I kind of know the way that world works. Yeah. And I've written novels and I've written an autobiography, but comics is just such a different, uh, approach. Um, it's a real, it's a, a hybrid approach, but it's actually, uh, 
a, a complete art form in its own in its own right you know right. That, that has has links to all of those other art forms but as it it, it it really is i mean the and i sat so they they introduced me to a writer called tony lee and tony and i got on great because we were both we we're all big fans of you know dracula and vampires and horror and everything and i pitched the story to him and he went oh he said that dark dark I said, yeah, it is. <laughs> um, and um, so he loved it. So we we had a kind of a, a dummy run with the comic, the prologue comic that we did. And the reason I, I did the comic there was because I thought, well, we can't afford to shoot the video because I did a, a treatment for the video for Afterglow of Ragnarok, which is, of course, nothing to do with the comic. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, so Afterglow of Ragnarok is I've got absolutely there's some songs on the album that have no you know visible you know link to the comic whatsoever right which is fine because the album is a standalone thing but uh, i had the problem that yeah i'm also trying to launch this comic and the first video has got to kind of do double duty and 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 launch both as it were it's got to stand up and have a link one with the other um so we uh we found a director finally. We'd done the comic. So we'd done the comic, eight page comic. Um, me and Tony wrote the script. We also wrote the script for Revelations in the Peace of Mind book as well, which mm. was my first introduction to comic script writing. Like, so you know, you come up with story, you come up with a story, but then to turn it into comic script, it's like, okay, this is frame one, frame two, frame three, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you can't say that there. Why can't I say that there? Because it's on the. Because you could, you're going to turn the page. You're going to turn the, yeah, you got to keep you know, the page turning. Yeah. And so, so, so you can't have, a, you, you've got to conclude something and then you turn the page and boom, you get new information and you're off into a, so it, it's, it's quite subtle, uh, funnily enough. And the other thing is, is that I realized that, that, that dialogue um, is just different. Dialogue is really, it, it's a, it's really like every, every bit of dialogue is like being punched in the guts, you know, mm -hmm. with, with comics, you know, it's, it's, it's almost a, every line is almost a slogan, you know, it's, uh, um, so, you know, you don't get long soliloquies, but then sometimes you do, <laughs> you know, yeah. it, 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 it's so you, um, it, it's a, it's a fascinating world. I really enjoy it. So we're, uh, we're on to, uh, script uh three um at the moment script two is uh already uh, is all is is close to conclusion of the uh art uh for script two uh which will come out at the towards the end of march and then uh script three we uh, i've just got the first iteration of it and it's actually pretty good so um be a few tweaks uh but you know, we've got plenty of time. And Tony's actually coming out to LA, so we'll we'll go and uh, if, get like a, an afternoon and, uh, and and tweak it a bit. Um, and then script four, we, we're already I'm already salivating over script four because <laughs> I've got some crazy <laughs> crazy shit ideas. And then it really goes the the, the it really the, the world really tumbles off its axis in uh, in uh, you know book two, beginning of book two. So. Uh, it's 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 an exciting project and it grows as you as you go through the script and you discover things. Yeah. So we we discovered um actually in the video there's a mirror in the in the afterglow of Ragnarok. There's a mirror uh which we built uh and in which um Necropolis when he's on his like acid trip, it's actually a mandrake juice potion, but He's on his trip, and he, the, the image of himself in the mirror is talking to him, uh, and that mirror does double duty as a kind of a a, world, a, 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 a a portal into another world, but also an exit point from the other world that's actually in his dream. Um, and uh, so we we're, were doing rain on the graves. And I said to to uh, to Ryan, I said, it's a shame we got that mirror, you know, because it cost us two thousand dollars to build that fucking mirror. You know, <laughs> and uh and I said, what are we gonna I said, what can we do? And 
I said, well, towards the end of it, I said, why don't we have the devil appear in the mirror um, holding the contract going, hey, buddy, your time's up, dude, your time's up. And um, so uh, that's when we came up with the idea of why don't we stab the devil through the mirror? And the devil yeah. falls out through the mirror. Yeah, we love it. You know, I mean, we, <laughs> we didn't we didn't quite have time to have like the we were going to stab him through the back of the mirror. Yeah. So we would fall out through the mirror with a big knife sticking out of his back. <laughs> but um, that turned out we, we had two days to shoot the whole thing, uh, everything. So we were we were like running out of time. We were, let's just stab it from the front. We everybody will know. You know, but if we have to see the knife going through the mirror, that's VFX and that starts getting, that's the pain in the butt. So uh, come on, let, let's try and make it all in camera, you know, as much as possible. So right. that mirror. But now we are making discoveries about um, about mirrors, which are really exciting, that will reflect, uh -huh, sorry for the pun, but will reflect <laughs> through, uh, you know, through, through, through the rest of it. Uh, so through the rest of the comic, you know, so it's, right. it's weird. One thing fertilizes something in somewhere else, you know. Exactly. Thank you, sir. Just to put a bow on this, Bruce, this yeah. is a question I like to ask everyone. Yeah. Have you ever had an experience you would consider supernatural or paranormal? Uh, yeah. Uh, eating, eating. <laughs> well, yeah, I would say paranormal. It's sort of like subnormal. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, eating space cake at a Ronnie James Dio show in Holland. And uh, I, I didn't realize what it was. I was just hungry. And everybody was laughing at me because I was eating. I said, oh, this is really tasty. I'm going to have another slice. And then I had another slice. And then I started hallucinating. Everybody turned into rotting vegetables. And um, <laughs> the world turned into black and white. And uh, everybody else was in, like, negative. And they're, they're, they all looked like Mr. Potato Head but their fingers were rotting carrots and they were all coming to get me. It was kind of cool. <laughs> that definitely counts. Yeah. <laughs> well, Bruce, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, man. I'm not going to keep you any longer. I know you got a, a lot of shit going on and I uh, thank you again. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. <laughs> Todd, thank you too as well, man. I'll yeah. uh, catch you guys around. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks, Bye -bye. Justin. I'll send you yeah. the file shortly. All right. Yeah. No problem. The men, right. the men, the men in white coats are outside anyway. So it's <laughs> yeah, I gotta get out of here. Yeah. <laughs>